today, very honored to be sitting with Pat Conroy, who's the author of a brand new book called South Abroad. Your fans will be extremely excited to know that it's coming. Uh, first of all, thank you for sitting down at Borders today. It is a pleasure. We are actually here at your home on Fripp Island near Beaufort, South Carolina. You know, you write about in your books, uh, having moved so much as a child, that there was really never a place that felt like home. Does Fripp Island feel like home yet to you? You know, Beaufort certainly seemed like home to me. Uh, I latched on to Beaufort. It was the 23rd move I had, because Dad was in the Marine Corps, 23rd I had since birth, and I came to Beaufort when I was 15. So I was miserable about moving again. I'd never heard of Beaufort, South Carolina. And I my mother said, why don't you make this your hometown? You know, you're a Marine kid. Any town you choose in America, you can make your hometown. So I latched onto this town like a barnacle. And poor Buford did not know what they were getting into. And I certainly did not know what they were getting into. But it has been, it has had the feel of home since I first drove in, you know, when I was 15. For South Abroad, the star of this book is, is Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina. You've been to Charleston? I have been to Charleston. I don't think I've spent the quality time you've spent in Charleston, but it's a beautiful city. No, I fell in love with Charleston. I went over with um, my high school English teacher, Gene Norris. And Gene would call me up and say, let's go rambling, boy. And we went uh, to Charleston for the first time. He wanted to look at antiques. Gene was a big antique guy. And he took me up there and he goes, he had this great southern accent. He goes, Lord, Lord, boy, I'm going to change your life forever. I said, why, Mr. Norris? And he said, because I'm taking you to the holy city. I'm taking you to Charleston, boy. And that's magic in anybody's life. And I remember him driving down. We drove in, and we got to this one spot, a place called the Four Corners of Law. And he took a right, and he said, now, boy, this is really going to change your life. I'm taking you south of Broad, the magical part of a magical city. And he did. I was blown away by the architecture, uh, the sheer beauty of Charleston. It is a completely beautiful city. Is that where then, is that south of Broad uh, title then stuck with you from that point on? Well, it, it stayed with me. I never heard, we're going south of Broad, S-O-B. And, you know, I didn't know what he was talking about that. But I certainly learned. Yeah. Well, Charleston is certainly one of the heroes of this book. You write about it so beautifully and so lovingly. Um, the, 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 the book opens with a scene with your, your, uh, your main character um, riding a bike through the streets of Charleston. And it's as lyrical a description of a city as you'll ever find. It was for fans of Pat Conroy, a uh, re-entry into this world that they know so well, this sort of beautiful prose that describes the city. Uh, for all of us, it's been 14 years since your last book. Does it feel okay, like that? Your last novel. I, your last know, novel. Yeah, we'll talk I, about my losing season and other books, your nonfiction work in a little bit, but does it feel like that long to you, that it's been that long? For, no. us, for us, you've been gone for a long time. Here, my great surprise in life, Rich, and this is my great surprise, how fast time passed. And you know, I can meet a student I taught at Buford High School. And I realize it's 35 years ago, which seems astonishing to me, almost 40 years ago in some instances. So the passage of time does seem uh, remarkable to me. And when they told me it was 14 years, I was going, my God, it took that long, but it did. It, you know, it took that long, and it, I worked on my losing season as hard as I've ever worked on a novel. So it felt the same way. You know, I worked on a cookbook just as hard as I'd ever worked on a novel. And when I got to this, it felt like, you know, going back into a sea I had not been swimming in for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I liked it. Yeah. Well, it feels great for those of us who, who know and love your work. The, um, the, the main character is uh, Leopold Bloom King, and he is named after a, a main character, the protagonist of Ulysses. And the, his brother... Um, who we learn about at the beginning of the novel is named Stephen Dedalus King, another character from Ulysses. And the mother is obviously a huge fan 
of, of the book Ulysses in the, in the book and celebrates Bloomsday and, and whatnot. Are you a fan of, of Ulysses yourself? You know, I'm more of a fan of the kid in the book. Uh -huh. It's, I'd read the book and it was, I remember I read it in high school and it was difficult for me. And it wasn't until I went back to it when I was in my 20s that I thought I got anything out of it at all. But what I had met in the meantime were Joyce scholars. Mm -hmm. And I'd never met these complete fanatics. Uh, you know, Bloomsday, there we go. And a lot of them would fly over to Dublin on yeah. Bloomsday and, you know, make that walk. And so it was interesting to me, and I met a woman who was completely berserk over James Joyce. I mean, there was not one thing this guy ever did, said, or breathed that she did not know about. Mm -hmm. So I used that for the mother of Leo King, Leopold Bloom King, and you've got to be a true fanatic of Joyce to name your children after that. And Leo says in the book, Mom, I'm Roman Catholic and you name me for an Irish Jew who lives in <laughs> Dublin. Can you explain that? And it was her passion for Joyce, uh, her passion for language that uh, I loved. I just loved it. Mm -hmm. She's a really memorable character. The father is a really memorable character too, and for fans of, of Pat Conroy, uh, this is a different type of father for you. This is a lovable, good father. Jasper is the name of the father. And um, unlike many of your stories, this is, a, this is a likable father. It was, I told myself before I died, I was gonna write about a good father. <laughs> and you know, in my, in my books, fathers come roaring in, the kids are flying out of the way, yeah. kids are bleeding in the corner. Uh, you know, kids <laughs> are always in danger, they're always in peril. So I've watched, you know, people who are terrific fathers, and I always wish I had one like that. So I decided in this book, okay, I'm going to give this kid, he's going to have enough problems as it is, but I'm giving this kid a good one. And I fell in love with that, that father. He's a great character, yeah, and it's a loving man. Um, people who've read your work know your relationship with your father, with Donald Conroy. You've talked about it a great deal. Um, he was the, the, the character behind uh, the great Santini, among other things. So when you thought of this character, does this have any bearing on your relationship with your father, how it evolved um, at the end of his life? You know, it probably, he, my father, in fact, I'm writing a nonfiction book now about how my father changed. After the great Santini, he loathed that portrait of him self more than anything I've ever seen. You know, I had no idea. Uh, Dad reading, I didn't know he was going to read the book. He'd never read a book in his life. And he moved his lips, he used his index finger. I mean, I said, Dad, what is this? You're commenting on a novel? This is a rare and privileged land you're entering into. And he spent the rest of his life trying to prove that I was wrong. And he did a good job. I mean, all seven of his children, we all hated him. And then this book comes out, and he did not like this unflattering portrait. So what he did, he found it in him to change. And all of us appreciated that change. But, you know, I doubt if he, inf now here's where Dad would get to me. I remember when the Prince of Tides came out, I made the father a shrimper. So my father comes over and says, hey, I hear I'm a shrimper this time, son. <laughs> I said, Dad, you couldn't catch a shrimp and a Long John Silvers. <laughs> and so Dad said, doesn't make any difference, son. And he said, I was such a powerful figure in your life that you can't write the word father without thinking of me. And he had me. He certainly had me. Yeah. But I could, after he died, you know, I could be grateful for what he became. But I wanted to write about a guy whose sweetness was the major part of this kid's life. Mm -hmm. And and I saw many instances of just males being nice and sweet. Mm -hmm. I almost get tear up when I go to the grocery store and I see a father being nice to his kid. And it gets to me and I cannot help it because I did not have that. So making up Jasper, who is my grandfather's name, was Jasper, is I loved every minute of it. 
when you were writing the character of Leo, um, did you have a model in mind for that character, or is that something that, that came out of a fictional world? You know, it came out, it's, um, you know, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to do not a boy like me particularly, but a boy that felt that way. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, when I talk to men, how did you feel about yourself as a kid? I felt ugly, I felt, you know, like a geek, I felt rejected. And I could certainly, I had all those feelings because I, I moved every year. And so I'd walk into school, I wouldn't know a soul in it. So I became adept at making friends who were, did, had no other friends. I'd look around and I could always tell them, the girls who weren't popular, make friends with those. Uh, boys who got picked on, make friends with them. And you know, I learned these little skills because I had to. It was, uh, and then, of course, we'd move the next year, and those friends uh, would all be gone, and I'd never see them again. And I've not seen them to this day a lot of times. 